In the year 2018, I presented a series at our Anchor School of Theology titled The End Time Dimension of the Parables of Jesus. The class was based on four specific sources. First of all, Scripture. Secondly, the book Christ's Object Lessons. Then the book Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing and some chapters from The Desire of Ages. As I prepared the study notes for this particular class, I was amazed at how many of the parables of Jesus deal directly with end time events. In fact, when I finished the 51 lessons for the class, we had 400 pages of material on the end time dimension of the parables. Today we're going to study a parable that is somewhat difficult. It has been called the parable of the unjust steward. But I have titled our study together, Lessons for the Sons of Light. Before we begin our study of the parable, we do want to ask the Lord to be with us. So I invite you to bow your heads reverently as we pray. Father in heaven, we come before your throne with gratefulness in our hearts because of the light that you have given us as a people. We have a glorious light that you have given us that is to circle the world. Unfortunately, many times we hide it under a bushel. I ask, Lord, that you will help your light shine in this final period of Earth's history. Bless us as we study this very important parable of Jesus that deals with the end times. Open our minds that we might understand and open our hearts to receive your word. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we begin to look at this parable, I want to just mention a couple of words about all of the crew that made this particular series possible. At Secrets Unsealed, some TV, we have the best group of people that I've ever worked with. I mean, it has been tireless the last three days, and I want to express my profound appreciation to all of those who have helped uh, make this uh, series a reality. Now let's go and speak about the parable. Both Ellen White and the Apostle Paul explained the central theme of the parable that we are going to study. And that central theme is a contrast between the here and now and the sweet by and by. I want to read from the first page of Ellen White's comments on this parable where she gives the central theme of the parable. It's found in Christ's Object Lessons, page 366. This is what she wrote. Christ's coming was at a time of intense worldliness. Men were subordinating the eternal to the temporal, the claims of the future to the affairs of the present. They were mistaking phantoms for realities and realities for phantoms. They did not by faith Behold the unseen world. Satan presented before them the things of this life as all attractive and all absorbing, and they gave heed to his temptations. The Apostle Paul wrote some similar sentiments in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 17 and 18 as he was writing to the churches in Corinth. And this is how the Apostle Paul expressed it. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, that's in the present, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. 
For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. So this parable has the purpose of contrasting living in the here and now and living with our minds in the sweet by and by. It's a contrast between the temporal and the eternal, the present and the future, phantoms and realities, the seen and the unseen, this life and the future life, the light affliction we suffer now, and the eternal weight of glory later. Those are the contrasts that are drawn both by Paul and by Ellen White. Now let's go to the parable. We're going to read it, and then we are going to interpret it. It's actually divided into several parts. First of all, you have the parable itself in Luke 16, verses 1 through 8, the first part of verse 8. Then you have the central lesson of the parable in chapter 16, verse 8, the latter half of the verse. Then you have the application or the explanation of the parable by Jesus in verse 9. And then finally you have some uh, counsel that Jesus gives based on the parable in verses 10 through 13. So let's move through uh, these four sections of this parable. Let's begin at Luke 16 and verse 1. He also said to his disciples, There was a certain rich man. Imagine the details in your mind. Place yourself there in your mind. There was a certain rich man who had a steward. We call them administrators today. So the rich man had a steward. And an accusation was brought to him, that is to the rich man, that this man was wasting his goods, that is the goods of the rich man. Verse 2, so he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be a steward. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, that is by the rich man, they may receive me into their houses. Verse 5, So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill, Sit down quickly and write 50. In other words, a 50% discount. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? So he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write 80, 20% discount. So, verse 8, So the master, that is the rich man, commended the unjust steward because he had cheated him. No, that's not what the parable says. And this is where people get confused. Actually, verse 8 says, So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. In other words, the focus is not on the, uh, defrauding the rich man or defrauding the owner. The point is that this man was shrewd in the plan that he devised. Up till here, we have the story of this secular seen uh, in verses 1 through 8, the first part of verse 8. Then the second part of verse 8, you have the central lesson, and probably Jesus is the one who is speaking here. Uh, it says there in Luke chapter 16 and verse 8, the last part of the verse, for the sons of this world, in other words, those who belong to this secular world, like the story that is just told about this unjust steward, are shrewder in their generation, in other words, they're shrewder in this life than the sons of the light. Now we have a new element that, that Jesus has introduced. You see, there's no mention of the sons of light in the parable. The parable is sim simply a story, a secular story of a rich man who had a steward 
and the steward prepared a shrewd plan so that when he was out of the stewardship he wouldn't become a homeless person. But now Jesus in verse 8, the second half of the verse, gives the central lesson and introduces a new element, and the new element is the sons of light. Once again, for the sons of this world are shrewder in their generation than the sons of light. And then Jesus is going to apply this parable to the sons of light. In other words, to the spiritual people of God. So he's taking a secular story and now he's going to make an application to those who claim to be God's people. In verse 9 we have the explanation that Jesus gives. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves. So Jesus is speaking to the sons of light. I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. Boy, that doesn't sound like Jesus that we're supposed to make friends with. Unrighteous mammon? What did Jesus mean? We'll come to that later. Make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. So we're left with a very serious question here. Make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, so that when you fail, they, it doesn't identify who they are, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Who received the sons of light into an everlasting home? It doesn't say. And then in chapter 16 and verses 10 through 13, we find Jesus making uh, some counsel to the sons of light about how they are supposed to live in this world in view of the world to come. I read beginning in verse 10, and I'm going to interpret as we go along. Jesus said, He who is faith in what is least, that is the affairs of this life, is faithful also in much that is in the next light, life. Do you remember in the parable of the talents, because you have been faithful in little, I will make you faithful over much? That's what Jesus means. He who is faithful in what is least, that is in the affairs of this life, is faithful also in much in the affairs of the next life. And he who is unjust in what is least, that is the affairs of this life, is unjust also in much that is in the next life. Verse 11, therefore if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, that is in the resources that you have in this life, who will commit to your trust the true riches which is in the world to come? Verse 12, and if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, in other words, that belongs to God, who will give you what is your own? That is when Jesus comes. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve unrighteous, uh, unrighteous mammon, as Jesus called it, and also be expecting to live in the future life, be welcomed into the future world. So basically, this is the parable, the central lesson of the parable, the explanation of the parable, and some counsel that Jesus gives at the conclusion of the parable. So now that we have in mind clearly the parable, and the counsel of Jesus, and the explanation of the parable, let's go through it verse by verse, and try to make sense out of it. Luke 16, 1 and 2, He also said to His disciples, There was a certain rich man, who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods, that is, the master's goods, the rich man's goods. Therefore he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be a steward. Show me what you've been doing with my resources, is what the owner is saying. Show me that you've been faithful in your stewardship, in your administration. Ellen White makes a comment about the attitude of this unfaithful administrator. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 369, Ellen White wrote, To the unfaithful steward, his Lord's goods had been entrusted for 
benevolent purposes. In other words, his master's goods that he had were to be used for benevolent purposes. She concludes by saying, but he had used them for himself. So notice the, the, what, the issue that we have here. The resources that had been given to this steward to use for benevolent purposes, he had used for himself for his present life. So now he is in a difficult predicament. Notice chapter 16 and verse 3. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. Ellen White uh, actually presents three paths that were open to this man, and he did not like any of them. Uh, Ellen White wrote, <clears throat> With the prospect of discharge before him, the steward saw three paths open to his choice. He must labor, beg, or starve. <laughs> None of those options were very good. Ellen White also on page 369 wrote these words which tell us what was the problem of this steward. The servant in the parable had, no, had made no provision for the future. In other words, he was living for the present, not for the future. The goods entrusted to him for the benefit, for the benefit of others he had used for himself. But he had thought only of the present. When the stewardship shall be taken from him, he would have nothing to call his own. So his problem is that he's living for himself in the present, and he's not living for others thinking about the future. That is the problem of this particular steward. So now the steward says, I'm between a rock and a hard place. I don't want to labor in something else. I don't want to beg, and obviously I don't want to starve. So what am I going to do? So he devises a shrewd plan. And that we find in chapter 16 and verse 4. Now he's go, he has a change of view. He says, now I'm not going to live in the present. I'm going to be thinking about the future. I'm not going to be using resources for myself, but I'm going to benefit others instead. So now he's, he, he's, uh, he's seen the light, if we might say. Now in chapter 16 and verse 4, he prepares this plan. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, that is when I'm no longer a steward, they may receive me into their houses. Who is they there? Well, the creditors of the rich man. Now let me read you uh, verses uh, 5 through 7. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? So he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write eighty. See, now he's benefiting others. He's not thinking about the present, enjoying everything in the present. He says, I'm going to be left out in the cold the stewardship is going to be taken away from me. I got to start thinking about what's going to happen in the future. And he says, I better not start using all of the resources for myself. I better start benefiting others. He used uh, actually dishonest means of doing it, but now he's thinking about others and he's thinking about the future. So he says, I am going to benefit these individuals, these uh, clients of, of my master, uh, so that when I'm put out of the stewardship, they will welcome me into their houses. Ellen White wrote in Christ's Object Lessons, page 367, the following words. Christ did not commend the unjust steward. In other words, Jesus didn't say, man, this guy did right. He defrauded because he's defrauding his owner. Uh, you know, he, 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 the, the, Jesus is not saying, you know, his, the dishonest means were correct. He's saying this man was shrewd in the plan that he devised. So once again, Christ did not commend the unjust steward, but he made use of a well-known occurrence, in other words, this was a true story that took place, 
to illustrate the lesson he desired to teach. On page 369 and 370, Ellen White wrote, But his master's goods were still in his hands, and he determined to use them now so as to secure himself against future want. To accomplish this, he must work on a new plan. Not the old plan of himself in the present, but for others in the future. So once again, to accomplish this, he must work on a new plan. Instead of gathering for himself, he must impart to others. And on page 367, Ellen White wrote, The unfaithful servant made others sharers with him in his dishonesty. He defrauded his master to advantage them, and by accepting their advantage, they placed themselves under obligation to receive him as a friend into their homes. In other words, he's buying them off. He's saying, hey, if I give them a discount, they're going to be obligated to receive me into their homes. So basically, this is the parable. And you say, now how could Jesus condone unrighteous mammon? And how could Jesus say that, uh, that this individual teaches a great spiritual lesson if he defrauded his, own, his owner or his master? Well, let's notice what the central theme of the parable is. Once again, this is in chapter 16 and verse 8, the first part of the verse. So the master, the King James uses the word Lord, the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. Do you really think that the master condoned what he did? Do you really think that the master said, man, this guy was great, he defrauded me? Of course not. He's emphasizing the fact that this individual was not thinking only about himself now. He wasn't thinking about the present now. He was thinking about the future, and he was thinking about benefiting others so that he could be welcomed into their homes. His plan was shrewd, not the method that he used was right. Ellen White wrote in Christ's Object Lessons, page 367, The worldly man praised the sharpness of the man who had defrauded him. However, the rich man's commendation was not the commendation of God. Now we need to remember that the parable is something that is happening in the secular world. Jesus is going to use this illustration to teach great spiritual truth. And so we find uh, in uh, chapter 16 and verse 8, the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. That's where the parable ends. And now Jesus is going to introduce a new element, which is the sons of light. And that's in chapter 16 and verse 8, the second half of the verse. Jesus states, For the sons of this world, that is illustrated by the story that is just told, the sons of this world are shrewder in their generation, in other words, in this life, then the sons of light. Now who are the sons of light? The sons of light are those who claim Jesus as Savior and Lord. In other words, the sons of light are individuals who have been saved by Jesus. They claim to follow Jesus. And so Jesus is saying, you know, what happened in this story, those who live in this life, they're shrewder, they're smarter many times than the sons of light. Now let's go to verse 9, chapter 16 and verse 9. Here Jesus states, And I say to you, who is Jesus speaking to here? here? He's speaking to the sons of light. He's speaking to believers, those who claim Christ. And I say to you, make friends. Are we supposed to make friends also? Just like this man made friends? Yes, of course, not by dishonest means but by honest means. So I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. So we're supposed to make friends by, for, by unrighteous mammon. You say, now wait a minute, pastor, how can we make friends with unrighteous mammon? Well, we need to understand what Jesus meant by unrighteous mammon. In a moment, we're going to notice that. 
So Jesus says, I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. That when you fail, actually it's when you're, when you're no longer a steward, they may receive you, that is the sons of light, into an everlasting home, that's heaven. <laughs> so Jesus is saying to the sons of the light, make friends now in this life by using unrighteous mammon, so that they, they have not been identified here, so that they may receive you, the sons of light, into an everlasting home. And so the question is, who are they that are going to welcome the righteous into an everlasting home? You know, you're left kind of in the air. Now let me read you several translations uh, of unrighteous mammon. I think the problem is with the translation. I'm going to begin with a new century version of Luke 16 and verses 8 and 9. So the master praised the dishonest manager for being smart. <laughs> I like that translation. Yes, worldly people are smarter with their own kind than spiritual people are. I like that. I tell you, make friends for yourselves using worldly riches. What is unrighteous mammon? The riches that we have in this world by worldly riches. So that when those riches are gone, you will be welcomed into those homes that continue forever. I want to read from the NIV. Once again, Luke 16 and verses 8 and 9. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are shrewder in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth. So what is unrighteous mammon? It is worldly wealth. Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. I want to read from the Good News translation. It's somewhat of a paraphrase, but it makes it very clear. As a result, the master of this dishonest manager praised him for doing such a shrewd thing. Because the people of this world are much more shrewd in handling their affairs than the people who belong to the light. And Jesus went on to say, And so I tell you, make friends for yourselves with, with worldly wealth. That's unrighteous mammon. With worldly wealth. So that when it gives out, when you don't have worldly wealth anymore, you will be welcomed in the eternal home. One further translation, this is definitely a paraphrase, the New Living Translation of Luke 16, 8 and 9. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then... When your earthly possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. Are you understanding a little bit better now what unrighteous mammon means? It means the resources we have in this life. Not only financial resources, but all of the resources that we have in this life. Now, to whom did Jesus address this parable? Jesus addressed it to five groups. You say, really? Five groups? Absolutely. Let's notice whom he addressed it to. First, he addressed it to the publicans. Let me ask you, were the publicans pretty much known as cheaters? Did they overcharge in taxes? Did they live for themselves? All we have to do is think of Zacchaeus, right? You know, he says, I'm going to give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone, that, that if is, you know, he had defrauded. He says, I'm going to give them four times as much as what I defrauded them. Well, you say, why, why does he only give half of his good to the poor? Well, because he needed the other half to reimburse fourfold to those who he had cheated. And so, so the publicans, they lived for the present. And they used worldly riches for themselves, just like in the story. Ellen White wrote in Christ's Object Lessons 368, there had been among the publicans 
Just such a case. This story took place in real life and Jesus is using it. There had been among the publicans just such a case as that represented in the parable. And in Christ's description, they, that is the publicans, recognized their own practices. Their attention was arrested and from the picture of their own dishonest practices, many of them learned a lesson of spiritual truth. So Jesus is speaking to the publicans, but He was also speaking to the disciples. Let me ask you, what were the disciples interested in? Well, you know, they said to Jesus, after the story of the rich young ruler, Lord, we followed you all the way. What's in it for us? And Jesus says, it's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom. They say, oh, if a rich man can't go, who's going to be able to go? They were in it for themselves, for the present. So Jesus is telling the parable to them. Ellen White wrote in Christ's Object Lessons, page 368, the parable was, however, spoken directly to the disciples. It was also addressed to the Pharisees. Let me ask you, who did the Pharisees live for? You remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man represents the Pharisees according to the context. You remember the Pharisees sat at his table and lived sumptuously with everything that he had. And then there's the poor beggar Lazarus who's at the foot of the table and he's eating the crumbs that fall off the table of the rich man. And the dogs come and lick his sores. The Pharisees were living for the present. They weren't thinking about the future. They were living for themselves. And Ellen White wrote in Christ's Object Lessons, page 369, the Pharisees filled with self-importance and self-righteousness were misapplying the goods lent them by God to use for His glory. On page 369 she also wrote, and the Savior was speaking also to the Pharisees. He did not relinquish the hope that they would perceive the force of His words. Many had been deeply convicted, and as they should hear the truth, under the dictation of the Holy Spirit, not a few would become believers in Christ. On the same page, she continued the scene known to have taken place among the publicans. He holds up before the Pharisees, both as representing their course of action and as showing the only way in which they can redeem their errors. The parable was also written to the Jewish nation. Let me ask you, had the Jewish nation appropriated to themselves all of the blessings that God gave them and excluded everyone else? Absolutely. So uh, Jesus is speaking this parable also to the Jewish nation. Let me read you a couple of statements. Christ's Object Lessons, page 369. So with Israel, God had chosen the seed of Abraham with a high arm. He had delivered them from bondage in Egypt, he had made them the depositories of sacred truth for the blessing of the world. Why had God given the truth to the Jews? As a blessing to the world. He had entrusted to them the living oracles that they might communicate the light to others, not living for the present, but for the future, not living for self, but living for others. She continues, but his stewards has, had used these gifts to enrich and exalt themselves. She continues writing, thus he might secure, um, let me see here, also, oh, it's also written for everyone. I will uh, come back to this other statement that I have at the top of the page. The other group that this parable was told by Jesus to was to everyone who claims the name of Christ. Let me just read you a few statements here uh, from the Spirit of Prophecy on this particular point. Uh, Christ's Object Lessons, page 369. Thus he might secure friends who, when he should be cast out, would receive him. That She's speaking about the parable itself. Then she comments this, So with the Pharisees, the stewardship was soon to be taken from them, and they were called upon to provide for the future. Only by seeking the good of others could they benefit themselves? Only by imparting God's gift in gifts in the present life could they provide for eternity. Let me ask you, 
do these lessons that were spoken to the publicans, the disciples, the Pharisees, and Israel, do they apply to God's church today? Here are the additional statements from the Spirit of Prophecy. She wrote, The lesson of this parable is for all. This is page 373. Everyone will be held responsible for the grace given him through Christ. Life is too solemn to be absorbed in temporal or earthly matters. The Lord desires that we shall communicate to others that which the eternal and unseen communicates to us. On page 370 she wrote, The Lord has endowed them, that is us, with capabilities and power and influence. He has entrusted them, that is us, with money. What for? That they may be co-laborers with Him and in the great redemption. All His gifts are to be used in blessing humanity, in relieving the suffering and the needy. We are to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to care for the widow and the fatherless, to minister to the distressed and downtrodden. In other words, the blessings we have received are not for us to enjoy, but thinking of the future to bless others. On page 371, she wrote, Alas, how many are appropriating to themselves the gifts of God? How many are adding, listen carefully, house to house and land to land? How many are spending their money for pleasure, for the gratification of appetite, for extravagant houses, furniture, and dress. Their fellow beings are left to misery and crime, to disease and death. Multitudes are perishing without one pitying look, one word or deed of sympathy. On pages 371 and 372 she wrote, They are embezzling His entrusted goods. Page 372, she wrote, Everyone will be required to render up his entrusted gifts. In the day of the final judgment, men's hoarded wealth will be worthless to them. They have nothing that they can call their own. And one final quotation on this, page 372, Those who spend their lives in laying up worldly treasure show less wisdom, less thought and care, for their eternal well-being than did the unjust steward for his earthly support. Less wise than the children of this world in their generation are these professed children of the light. Notice, not children of the light, professed children of the light. Now, do you remember that Jesus said, and I'm going to read uh, that verse again, in chapter 16 and verse 9, I'm going to read it once again, the word they is the key word. Jesus says, I say to you, that is to us, the children of the light, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that means by the resources that God has given us now, that when you fail, that is, when we no longer have those resources, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Who is they? who are going to receive the children of the light into an everlasting home, the children of the light that have not thought about the present, but about the future, that have not lived by, for self, but have lived for others. Who are they that will welcome the children of the light into the kingdom? Well, let me read you Christ's Object Lessons, page 373, and then I'll read you a statement from Albert Barnes, the great Presbyterian Bible commentator. Ellen White wrote on verse 9, God and Christ and angels are all ministering to the afflicted, the suffering, and the sinful. Give yourself to God for this work. Use His gifts for this purpose, and you enter into partnership with heavenly beings. <laughs> are you catching the picture? God Christ and the angels are all ministering to the afflicted. When we use the gifts that God has given us to do the same, we are entering a partnership with heavenly beings. She continues, Your heart will throb in sympathy with theirs. You will be assimilated to them in character, that is, to God, to Christ, and the angels. To you, these dwellers in eternal tabernacles 
will not be strangers. When earthly things, this is unrighteous mammon by the way, when earthly things shall have passed away, the watchers at heaven's gates will bid you welcome. Are you catching the picture? So it's the Father, the Son, and the angels who are going to welcome those who have thought about the future and who have used their gifts to benefit others. Let me read you this statement from Albert Barnes, the great Bible commentator. He's commenting on this particular parable. How can we deposit riches in heaven so that we will be welcomed by the heavenly beings? He answers, this may be done by using our riches as we should do. That is, by not suffering them, that means not allowing them to entangle us in cares and perplexities dangerous to the soul, engrossing the time and stealing away the affections, by employing them in works of mercy and benevolence, aiding the poor, contributing to the advance of the gospel, bestowing them where they will do good, in such a manner that God will approve the deed and will bless us for it. Jesus told the parable because he had a hope that the publicans and the Pharisees and Israel, as well as us and the disciples, would rectify the way that we are living in the present. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 374 and 375, Ellen White wrote, To those who have squandered his goods, Christ still gives opportunity to secure lasting riches. Isn't that wonderful that it's not too late? Ellen White tells us, if we've squandered God's goods to this point, Christ still gives opportunity to secure lasting riches. He says, that is Jesus says, give and it shall be given unto you. Provide yourselves with bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So now let's uh, summarize uh, the comparison between the story or the parable and the application that Jesus makes to the children or to the sons of the light. This is how it works. If a worldly person who has squandered his master's goods, we're talking about the parable now, if a worldly person, a secular person who has squandered his master's goods, that is his bosses in this case, goods, he fears that it's going to be discovered that he hasn't invested his master's resources the way he should, he starts thinking about the future. And he begins to benefit others so that his friends will welcome him into their temporal homes. So that is the parable. A worldly person who has squandered his master's goods starts thinking about the future, begins benefiting others, albeit with uh, dishonest methods, so that his friends will welcome him to their temporal homes. Now comes the application. So, if the children of the light have squandered God's goods, and they start thinking about the future, and they use the resources God has given them to benefit others, the heavenly beings will eventually welcome them to their heavenly home. Now you say, now wait a minute, um, how is it possible that, you, that uh, Jesus um, uses the story of uh, someone who used uh, you know, uh, dishonest methods to benefit other individuals? Well, that's not the point of the parable. The point of the parable is not what the unjust steward did. It has to do with him not living for the present, but living for the future, not benefiting himself, but benefiting others. Let me give you another illustration, another parable of Jesus where you find this um, comparison by way of contrast. You remember the story of the widow that kept coming and coming and coming and coming to the judge for the judge to do her justice? Remember that story? Well, 
you know, uh, it's interesting that she keeps on, keeps on coming and coming and coming to the judge. And the judge is described as one who does not fear God or regard man. He's a secular judge. And he keeps on putting off the widow and puts her off and puts her off and puts her off. And eventually he says, man, this woman has become such a pest. I'm going to do her justice to get her off my back. And so he does her justice. And then Jesus applies the parable. He says, the end time generation are going to do the same thing as the widow. They're going to cry out to God and cry out to God and God is going to delay and delay and delay. But eventually God is going to do justice to his people. So how can a secular judge who puts off a widow uh, be, uh, until she becomes such a pest that he wants to get her off his back, how can that be compared to God? Because in the parable this judge represents God. Well, the fact is that Jesus is saying, if an unjust judge, the judge that does not fear God or regard man is willing to answer the pleas of a widow to get her off his back, how much more will God answer the pleas of his people because he loves them? Are you understanding what I'm saying? So in other words, the motivation for answering is different. He's going from lesser to greater. This is the way it works. If an unjust judge who does not fear God or regard man answer the pleas of, answers the pleas of a widow in the secular realm, how much more will God answer the pleas of his people not to get them, get them off his back, but because he loves them? And so in the story of the unjust steward, if an unfaithful steward, after wasting his master's goods, comes to himself and invests in the future by thinking of others, though with dishonest means, that's the secular realm, how much more should God's people who have wasted God's goods consider their ways and by honest means invest in the future kingdom, in the spiritual realm? And then Jesus offers his final counsel to his people. Luke chapter 16 and verses 10 to 13, and we already reviewed this when we started our study, but let's do it once more. He who is faithful in what is least, that's our stewardship now, in this life, is faithful also in what? In much. If we're not faithful here, what makes us think that we're going to be faithful when we get to heaven? Well, we're not going to get there if we're not faithful here. He continued, and he who is unjust in what is least, that is in this life, is unjust also in much in the life to come. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, that is in the resources you have received in this life, who will commit to you the true riches, that is the riches in heaven? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, that is, belongs to God, who will give you what is your own? Because when we, when we get there, we will inherit all things with Jesus. No servant can serve two masters. In other words, no, no servant can serve mammon, everything here, live for self, live for the present, and also love God at the same time. Once again, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Is this parable making sense to you? Isn't it an amazing parable about what God's people should be doing at this time in history? Now let me give you one final story that we find in the book of Hebrews. Let's talk for a couple of moments about Moses. Moses was probably the greatest person in the entire Old Testament. That's my own personal opinion. Ellen White says he was a historian, he was a philosopher, he was a military commander, a multi-talented man. And he was next in line to become the Pharaoh of Egypt. The most powerful nation in the world at that time. But then Moses remembered his roots and God gave Moses a choice. God said to Moses, hey Moses, I want you to go out into the wilderness 
with Israel, with this people. They're going to criticize you. They're going to want to stone you. They're going to hate you. But I want you to choose that. I want you to go uh, into the wilderness and suffer affliction with the people rather than staying in Egypt and becoming the next Pharaoh. Let's read Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 24 to 26. Hebrews 11 verses 24 through 26. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy, listen carefully now, the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. What did Moses live for? Did he live for himself? No. Did he live for the present? No. He looked to the reward, it says here. Now let me ask you this. Where, would, where is Moses today? Oh, we all know where Moses is. Moses is in heaven, right? Was he welcomed into his everlasting home? Because he did not live for the present and he did not live for himself. Yes, God and Christ and the angels welcomed him into the everlasting home. Now let me ask you this. Where would Moses be if he chose to stay in Egypt? He would be a mummy. Perhaps in one of the pyramids of Egypt. Or if it was fortunate, in the basement of the British Museum. <laughs> did he make the right choice? Yes, he made the right choice. He did not live by unrighteous mammon, by the treasures of this life. He was looking for the reward in the future, and he preferred to suffer with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Folks, I believe that we're living in the last moments of the history of this world. I know we've heard that. I've heard that since I was a child, and my parents heard it since they were children, and probably their parents heard it from the time that they became converted to the Lord. But I believe that everything we see going on in the world indicates that uh, there is going to be uh, some incredible things happening very shortly in this world. What are we doing with the resources that we have? I want to end by reading from early writings, pages 56 and 57. This chapter is on the duty of God's people in the time of trouble. And I believe she's talking about the little time of trouble here, not the great time of trouble. This is what she wrote. Houses and lands will be of no use to the saints in the time of trouble. For they will then have to flee before infuriated mobs. And at that time their possessions cannot be disposed of to advance the cause of present truth. I was shown that it is the will of God that the saints should cut loose from every encumbrance before the time of trouble comes and make a covenant with God through sacrifice. Do you know what sacrifice is? Sacrifice is not giving a large sum. Sacrifice is not measured by how much you give, but by how much you have left after you gave. That's how sacrifice is measured. Most of us give from our abundance, a pittance to the Lord. But Ellen White tells us that we need to cut loose from every encumbrance before the time of trouble comes and make a covenant with God through sacrifice. Then she continues, I saw that if any held on to their property and did not inquire of the Lord as to their duty, he would not make duty known and they would be permitted to keep their property. And in the time of trouble, it would come up before them like a mountain to crush them. And they would try to dispose of it, but would not be able. 
I heard some mourn like this, because she's seen this in vision. This is what they say. The cause was languishing. God's people were starving for the truth. And we made no effort to supply the lack. Now our property is useless. Ellen White is not telling us that we need to become homeless. What Ellen White's saying is we're not supposed to hoard, to accumulate, to have much more than we'll ever need. You know, we're always saving for a rainy day. We're saying, well, you know, I, I, I have 500,000 in my 401k, you know, but I never know whether I'm going to need more. So we're always more and more and more. I've said this before. Ellen White tells us that Noah invested all that he had in the ark. Everyone else was saving for a rainy day. Do you get the point? What happened when the rain came? They were all lost because they lived for the present, not for the future. There are many ministries that are operating today presenting present truth that need the support of those who enjoy the presentations that are made. And I'm not only talking about secrets unsealed in some TV, there's amazing facts, there's, uh, you know, so many uh, keep the faith, there's so many good ministries, watch and pray, something that is done every year. So a convention like this, this year we had to do it uh, electronically because, <laughs> because of the coronavirus, but you know, I've spoken at several of these. Wonderful ministries that are presenting present truth. And there's nothing better we can do than to support these ministries through our prayers and also through our donations so that the ministries can continue producing materials such as what we've seen this weekend. Secrets Unsealed has greatly intensified the production of programs during the coronavirus because I'm not able to travel anywhere. So I'm bound to uh, this place. And praise the Lord, I've gotten so much accomplished because I don't have to travel on planes anymore. I don't have to go preach in different places. So I've been able to write a lot. I've been to be able to produce many programs. But these ministries need our support. So I pray that the Lord will remind you to pray for all of these ministries and also to support them financially so that they can continue sharing present truth with the church and with the world. So this brings to a conclusion our seminar. May God bless you all, keep you in His care, and we hope to see you again soon.